Welcome to Hindu Analysis, July 10, 2018. So these are the topics that we are going to discuss today. So the first article is HRD Ministry grants institution of eminence status to IIT Delhi, IIT Bombay and IISC Bangalore. If at all this institution of eminence is given to some institutions, then what could be the uh, impacts on those institutions? That is what we are going to see. So the first one is it grants a full autonomy to the institution, which means the institution is now uh, have its full autonomy in case of uh, devising its own curriculum, syllabi, etc. It, it could also facilitate those institutions to grow more rapidly with more skills and quality improvement. And it could also enable those institutions to become the world class institutes. So this institution of eminence is given to six institutions. So out of which three are private sector institutions and three are public sector institutions. If you could see then these are the list of institutions which get this uh, institution of eminence status. So what is the aim of this institution of eminent status given to these institutions? So there, there are two aims. One is to bring this selected, these higher educational institutions into top 500 of world ranking institutions in the next 10 years and in top 100 eventually over time. So this is the first major aim of this, uh, giving the tag of institution of eminence to any institution. And also the second major aim is to provide the world class teaching and research facilities to the Indian students within our country. Country. So this is also a major aim of this status, uh, I mean this institution of eminent status. So these six institutions are selected by uh, Empowered Expert Committee which is constituted for this purpose itself. So if you see in this image, uh, here you can see uh, the six institutions of eminence. So these institutions have full flexibility in fixing their curriculum and syllabus and it can also admit about 30% of foreign students with no restrictions on fee. This is a major thing. It is also free from all the regulators like AICTE which is the All India Council for Technical Education and the UGC which is now getting converted into HECA if at all this HECA bill gets implemented. So it is free. This institution of eminence uh, now have its full autonomy. So it is free from these kind of regulators. So the second article is the Supreme Court says it is ready to go live. Center also moves for a TV channel, which means uh, based on this information, which is the citizens have the right to information. It is their basic fundamental right. And also the matters of constitutional and national importance should be known to the uh, citizens of the country. So based on this context, now the Supreme Court decide to uh, make the court proceedings live so this live stream is an extension of the open court system we all know what an open court system is in an open court system the people can just walk in the courts and they can just watch the cases or the proceedings whatever taking place in the court so it is just an extension so this live stream is an extension of the open court system because it is also open to all the people they can watch it so the litigants law students and the public can watch the court proceedings as and when they are happening in the courts uh, by means of this live streaming. So if you see a three judge bench of Supreme Court only favored this uh, live streaming of court proceedings. So initially they plan to start this as a pilot project in only one court. Later if at all it gets success then it is uh, extended to all other courts. So initially the government wants to uh, start this live streaming as a pilot project in one court and later it just plan to expand to all other courts. So this live streaming of the proceedings in the court uh, would bring transparency and access to justice of the citizens of the country. As we said already that the citizens have the right to information and the constant institutional and the national important matter if at all gets a uh, live stream then it will be helpful and it will be beneficial for the citizens of the country. But there are uh, some concerns over this live streaming of the court proceedings. So what are they? So this is the major concern which is live streaming of these cases which may involve national security concern cases or matrimonial disputes or the rape cases which could be led to the violation of the fundamental right to privacy. So these cases if at all getting live streamed then it is going to affect the fundamental right which is the right to privacy. So this writ petition is filed for the enforcement of the public interest to advance the rule of law and as well as to bring the accessibility and transparency in the administration of the justice. The third article is living in uncertain times. So this article uh, deals with the matter of stability of which government whether it is an autocratic government or it is a democratic democratic government. So this article starts like India needs strategic cohesion and government opposition dialogue 
which is very important for the proceeding of the government in a stable way so they also stated some examples which are happening in the contemporary world like if in case it, it is north korea so we can see uh, the north korea was considered as an axis of evil by the us and much of the western countries but now recently mr trump and uh, uh, north korea's president have had a meeting without much diplomatic uh, debate and all they, they just told like north korea is not that much threat to the us and it is not that much an enemy to the us so they uh, in this article they gave some examples like what are happening in our contemporary world so for example north korea is considered as an axis of evil by the us and much of the western countries and also in case of russia it is blamed for the human rights violation by its president afghanistan is a lo lot affected by the uh, terror attacks and in case of west asia it is also indulged in more several wars and syria is worst affected we all know and the tensions between iran and saudi arabia as well as israel and muslim world have also be getting intensified day by day so the saudi arabia also led the war against yemen and in south asia even the very small country called uh, maldives like maldives is also challenging a greatest neighbor like our country which is india so these are all what happening in the contemporary world so this is how the article is proceeding they also states that the dictatorship is more stable than the democratic one so they proceed like this the autocracies or the dictatorships remains more stable while the democracies are increasingly dysfunctional for example in case of china even though it is a dictator one or even though it is an autocratic one it is in its steady progress despite of the dip in its economic forecast like it it has its own aim like becoming a moderately prosperous society in 2021 made in china target by 2020 25 china to be become a fully developed nation by 2049 so despite of the fact that it is being an autocratic one it is now proceeding in its target in a very clear and steady phase similarly other dictatorial countries or other dictatorial regimes like turkey and russia is also proving that they are more resilient rather than despite of being an autocratic one but in case of democratic countries like us like india us uk germany this ruling parties and the opposition parties are in increasingly working at cross purposes because they are not coherent they are not convergent at their purposes they are divergent in their aim this led to the uh, dysfunctionality so this cross purpose or this uh, different aims of the uh, ruling government and the oppositional party could lead to the dysfunctional and the destabilization of the any government so as a democratic government uh, we should have the parliament debate regularly so it is a must but in our uh, practical situation it is not so it is not happening so this absence of debate in the parliament may also be the cause for these uh, things like we recently had the postponement of 2 plus 2 dialogue with india and us and the india's relationship with china is also not that good even though we are attending that uh, wuhan summit it is not that good and our relationship with russia is also still in question we don't know where we stand with the relationship with russia and the nepal and the maldives are also now shifting their focus towards the china rather than relying on india so these are all could be the consequences of uh, our instability in conducting the debate in the parliament instability in our governance could be the reasons why our neighbors seem to be drifting away from india so what is needed so aiming strategic autonomy is one thing it is right but it is only not enough so india needs a national consensus and to tide over the crisis whatever we are facing now and to withstand the pressure whichever given by the other countries over us so we need to have a national consensus which means we should the even though the ruling party and the opposition have a different point of opinions or different cross purposes they should have to work in together they should have to work uh, in consensus so only we could tackle the crisis or the pressure that is given by the other countries over us so this cannot happen which means the stability of the government could be achieved if and only if uh, the detailed debate and the negotiations are happening between the ruling party and the opposition in the parliament so the next article is in need of a practical plan on judicial appointments so 
the data suggests there are 23 percent of vacancies persisting in the lower judiciary the center is also now proposing for some centralized selection mechanism for the judges like the district judges and the civil judges in the courts by means of some uh, central mechanism but this is now becoming a major concern for the states so the states started opposing this centralized selection mechanism because uh, they suggest like for civil judges uh, they have to take 321 days and for district judges they have to take 183 days respectively for the appointment process or for the recruitment process but this stage wise and uniform timeline for the lower judicial appointments all over the country in a similar way is problematic because we know that each and every state is different and each and every state's resources are different so on the basis of that only we have to conclude the number of days that it require for the recruitment process but this centralized scheme of making a single timeline for all the courts is not that much efficient so that is what they suggest in this article but uh, implementing this centralized mechanism may raise certain concerns so these are the concerns so the first one is the rationale behind arriving at this timeline like the 321 days or like the 180 days so this rationale behind this arriving of this timeline for all over the country is still unclear and the second concern is the inaccurate benchmark to measure the performance of the states as it doesn't consider different sanctioned strength and state resources in conducting such examinations as we said before each and every state is different and the resources are different so in measuring the performance of those states in terms of uh, recruitment process for the judges we uh, it is also again a still a major concern because it is different so making one size fit all approach in the recruitment process for all the state is uh, raising the opposition from the state in Himachal Pradesh and in Maharashtra they have sanctioned the strength of like 62 and 1018 so for Himachal Pradesh the uh, number of recruitment seats is like 62 and for Maharashtra it's like 1018 but both have to complete the recruitment process within 321 days so it is again you see the contradiction right I mean for Himachal Pradesh it obviously took like very lesser number of days of 178 days but for Maharashtra it take like 443 days uh, sim approximately to complete the recruitment process so this one size fit all approach again uh, doesn't fit for all strict adherence to such timelines is also affecting the aspirants and this aspiring candidates also find it impossible to appear for the examination in multiple states if at all the candidate is eligible to attend the examination in other state but if it is going to conduct the examination at the same time then it is becoming a concern for the student to attend in other state so this is a major concern in terms of students perspective so this idea of a uh, definite timeline uh, for the recruitment process in the lower judge or lower courts is good one but uh, while taking these steps the administrative and the resource capacities of the different states should be taken into account and also the rationale behind the devising of this timeline should be a data driven one and a methodological one or a scientific based one then only it will be an effective one so the next topic is the measure of the tests the government is now planning to conduct this test which is the JEE and the NEET joint entrance examination for the admission into technological institutions like IITs, NITs and triple ITs and NEET which is the national eligibility come entrance test for the undergraduate medical courses so the government is planning to conduct these two tests twice a year so this thing which is conducting these two examinations twice a year there are much more thing need to be done so to make the higher education accessible to the students especially for the rural students who are suffering from various handicaps like uh, in availability of the resources or inaccessibility of the students from a very remote villages and it is also the shaky school education system which means even though we are providing the higher education uh, in a very better way and even though we could improve the accessibility of these higher education but if at all the school education education system is not that much good then it is of no use so we have to take in that also into account so viewed against this background the decision of the center to form the national testing agency to conduct these tests which is the JE and NEET is also uh, a progressive move so this national testing agency is a center one which means it under this only now they are going to conduct this JE and NEET examination so before it was handled by CBSE but now it is moving from CBSE to this national testing agency 
so this professional agency which is the national testing agency would look at nothing but the meritorious nature of the student only when taking the students into this higher education institutions so the next one is like the national testing agency's role so we all know that this national testing agency is going to be the top or apex institution in case of conducting this neat and je examination so this should be based on as we said it should be based on the meritorious uh, nature of the student and also the second one is the contention of states anyway the center or nation uh, the common national examination could be a better one if at all it's getting implemented okay aptitude testing should also be uh, done in order to filter the candidates into the uh, in higher education institutions uh, so the curbs on the commercialization of the higher education so if this commercialization of higher education is being curbed then the medical courses are available to the students in all the 350 medical institutes which could constitute around 175 private institutes also so it is a major uh, good thing or it is a major move so it is not new which is already in place in the sense this conducting examinations twice a year uh, more than once a year is not new to our country because we already conducting the gre and toefl examinations more than once a year so, so we should not afraid of conducting this examinations twice a year and we should move forward or we should go forward in implementing already ashok misra committee recommended that the online aptitude test should be should be offered two to more times a year for the students so however this should not be a barrier for the students from rural backgrounds and it should not also putting some additional expenditure for the students for their preparation travel to a testing center and so on so it also should be taken into account while devising these kind of examinations for multiple times so for doing all these things in an efficient way good planning and allocation of sufficient funds is needed from the state and the central government so equally important is the issue that regulation of the coaching institute there are a lot of coaching institute now mushrooming so it is very uh, they are also charging more on the students to get the coaching done so it is also should be under the regulation or it should also be getting monitored under the government so it is not only by means of uh, implementing this multiple opportunities to conducting the examinations but it is also very important that the school education which is the very basic, basic education should also gets revamped then only the this <clears throat> implementation of uh, more than twice a year this neat examination or je examination is going to affect